You, who says their name first, me or you? You say your name. I won't say my name. My name's already in the theme song. Taylor. And Alan talking about movies. They may be best friends, but they always disagree. Taylor. And Alan. I seen that. <laughs> All right. So, Rin, you were on the podcast uh, a couple weeks ago. We talked about Death Wish, your favorite movie of the year. Your best movie of the year, yeah. Best movie of the year. I better, think better than Ready century. Player One, which was did you, uh, did you also like, another favorite. Did you like that? No. It's terrible, no. right? It was so boring. Uh, you know, I could I could go on about that one for a while. It uh, was I mean, one, it was unbelievably unbelievable based on how ugly well, movie, that girl was. Like, he could never love her because she has a birthmark over her eye. Like, That was gross. disgusting. Gross. People were vomiting in the theater. Yeah. As soon as she moved her hair, everyone just... There was someone who fainted in the theater I was in. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah, like the... That's uh, why it has only a 70% because that birthmark <laughs> was so f***ing gross. <laughs> it was so dumb. Like, I get... I get it. If you're actually that girl, maybe you're insecure. But this movie was like, I don't even know. It, it acted like it was, it was a big a, deal. And, uh, it was a sinful movie. And let me tell you something. I'm no, like, I'm not a YouTube god by any stretch. Yeah. But I could make about a, I'm thinking a 15 to 20 minute long video that about all the sins that that movie had. Oh, yeah? Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Yeah, what, what would easily. you call it? I'd call it um, Bible cinema. Okay. I was uh, thinking Christ- all, all the cinema. things incorrect. Everything incorrect with yeah, there you go. Ready Player One Yeah, in, would uh, be the name of the video. In more than 15 minutes. And look, I, I even got this ready. So like, say, so like, say that there's a problem with the movie, right? We'll call that a sin just off the top of my head. And what yeah. would happen is every, every time afterwards, after I'm done with saying what the sin was, uh-huh. I'd, 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 I'd do this. There you go. That seems like a good yeah. idea. Well, well yeah. what would you say when the sins came up? Uh, ready player one. <laughs> Why did you use that font? Uh, Ready Player One, directed by Steven Spielberg. I'm going to take a point off because Steven Spielberg hasn't made anything fantastic since 1972. Uh, What else does he do? Uh, Not giving a lap dance. I think that's one of them. (laughs) Oh, um, uh, this movie doesn't have any boobs in it. (laughs) Like, he'll talk about things that aren't even related to the movie. Yeah, it takes points away from the movie. It's terrible. I used to like it. I used to like it when it, they were like two or three minutes long. Cause when it was new. Yeah. Well, cause they like, you could find decent points to fit into a two or three minute video. But when you're going, stretching it out to like 20 minutes, you're really scraping you know the bottom that, yeah. of the barrel for money, I assume, right? Like the longer you have people um, watching, the more yeah, the, the more YouTube will show other people the video. Exactly. The watch like time the longer, algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. So also they can put a ton of mid rolls on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can put a ton after you break 10 minutes, right? That's the whole thing. You can put almost as many as you want after 10 minutes. Yeah. Which is a dumb like system. In my, they should just my King's standardize room. it. Oh, sorry. Go on. Uh, I was just saying they should just standardize well, it like where it's. Every three minutes, you can add a new ad roll. Something like that. I, I think there is something like that. I think there's like a 30-second limit or a minute okay. limit or something. I've never tried to push it because yeah. I'm, not, I'm not the Monopoly man. But but I, I typically do one every 10 minutes. If I have a 30-minute video, I'll probably have three, two yeah. to three in there, which that's, I think that's fine. I mean, that's that's less than what they do on TV shows. I had three ads... Or three mid rolls on my Kingsman video, which is forty two minutes long, and also took me about one hundred and fifty hours to make total. That's and t- you know, fun fact: that's twice as long as they took to write the script for the Kingsman too. You're probably right. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what we're, we're talking said, about today. 
I had too many ads on it. They said it, they disliked the video because there's oh. too many ads. People whine and about I everything. That, that tickled me. Yeah, especially they especially they, like to whine about the Kingsmen. Well, it's bad. Okay, yes, yes, it is. That's what we're here to talk about, right? The Kingsmen in general. Kingsmen in general. <clears throat> That's the third one, right? Which? Yes. <laughs> Uh, the third one. So let's let's go over Which the first one. Greenlit, by the way. Is this the third one with Greenlit? Yeah, they want oh. the Rock as the villain. Uh, I, oh I, yeah, yeah. I think we talked about this last time. We did. Time, yeah. We did. Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like uh, they should just let this die. They should erase the second one, bury all the copies of the second one with the ET Atari video game. And, I, uh, I want them to save it, in a way. The uh, series? But, like, to recover the series? Yeah, like, I, I'd like to see it come back, but I also don't think I, I can w- watch it again. And even if it's really, really great, I don't know if I can get everything out of the third one that I got out of the first one because of how much the second one burned me. Yeah, well, they used all their their ammunition, right? They Every... Everything that they could do that would have an impact later on, they've done in the second one. Yeah. Like, there's nothing that they we, could we should... do in the third one to really make you feel any emotions. Like, they can't... There's nothing else they can take away because, one, they can always bring, it, bring back, it back. Or, two, it's already been taken away. Yeah. It's the same, the same issue that, uh, Walking Dead has. I don't know. I, I stopped watching it two seasons ago, but with Glenn, right? I don't know if you watched it. Lucky. He. <laughs> yeah, I'm all caught up. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's so, uh, engaging and fast paced. <laughs> the, uh, when Glenn fake died and then died two episodes later or whatever it was, it meant nothing because they have already wasted that, that emotion. You can't. You can't. It's true. Do it and take it away and do but it again. I really liked that uh, because, like, when 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 Glenn fake died, yeah, and the camera zooms out, and it looked like he's getting eaten. Mm-hmm. I didn't put much thought into it, as I typically don't with that show. It's the <laughs> safest bet. Yeah. And I thought, oh, they killed Glenn. That's great. Good. Good for them. They're brave. They did it. And then I watched Jeremy John's video on it. I don't know why. Ooh. My life was in a pretty dark place at the time, I yeah. guess, if I'm watching Jeremy Johns. <laughs> but Jeremy Johns was saying, he, he just like said something offhand. He's like, some people are saying he didn't die, but I, 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 we saw him die. He's definitely dead. And then that made me go, oh, I, I bet you he's not dead. So Jeremy Johns actually, in a way, uh, spilled the beans for me. What? what uh, so when he came back, I wasn't surprised. Well, ruined it for me he, was the talking dead. Oh, Did you, ever, <laughs> you watched you, that too? Yeah. That's as sad as Jeremy Johns. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's worse. Uh, but right after that episode, Scott Gimbel, the, the guy who was the running, showrunner. yeah, the showrunner, he, uh, he was just like, well, Glenn's story is not over yet. We're just going to have to wait and see what happens. And it was like, oh, yeah, clearly he's, he's alive. He said that? Yeah. Oh my god! I I don't remember if he said it directly or if it was a a letter that Chris Hardwood read from him. But someone said, "Don't worry, guys. Glenn's story's not over. Like, I'm not saying he's not dead, but his story's not over." It's like, what does that Terrible. mean? Yeah, it was really bad. But I like the way they actually killed Glenn. I thought that was impactful. Ah, uh, it didn't matter. Or Negan. Yeah, at that point, it didn't they, matter. they should have done it but, at the end of that season. They should not have made you wait however many I, months. I agree. <clears throat> they should have just but pulled the trigger the right same away. Time, they want people to watch, you know, and they want you to... So it's like... Yeah, so make the show you, good. If you, if you no end one, the season no one, on a note like that of Glenn getting killed, uh-huh. and that's how you end the season... I think that would have put a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. But at the same time, what they should have done is just have the season seven premiere 
should have been the season six finale. Like that entire episode where we set up, like, Glenn dies in the beginning and at the end it's like, we gotta fight this Negan guy or whatever. What they should have done Does is any- killed Abraham at the end of, was it season six? Is that what it was? Yeah. I don't know which season it was. Killed him at the end of that season and then killed Glenn at the beginning of the next one. So you, yeah, you that, end that on, shocked everyone. you end on a, uh, a subversion of expectations, right? Cause in the comics, Glenn is the one who dies. So you kill Abraham yeah. and everyone's like relieved because Glenn pretended to die, but then survived. Like, so you, you felt like, Oh, we lost Glenn, but now he's back. Then you get to the end, Abraham dies and you're like, Oh, Glenn is safe. We're good. Then you open up the season, yeah. kill Glenn right away. And then everyone's like, Oh crap. <laughs> and then you can start going. But, uh, no, they're, it's terrible. I love watching reactions to that scene because people are blubbering and crying. <laughs> those like are it, like they're actually there. I, I I can't believe it. I hate those uh, YouTube videos so much. The reaction videos where, like, especially the trailers when people are crying about Star Wars coming out and like all this stuff. It's like it's so fake. You're such a faker. You probably watched this already before you even turned on your camera. You know exactly what's happening. And you're pretending to be in awe so people will be excited. And it's just making everything worse. Speaking of making everything worse, <clears throat> Kingsman 2. Kingsman 2. So let's talk about the first one for a minute before we get into the second Absolutely. one. Absolutely. What do you think is great about the first one? I... Uh... I loved it. I thought the action was great. I thought the the subversion. I, I kind of see it as like to a different extent. It's 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 to spy movies what Cabin in the Woods was to horror. Okay, I and don't think I ever saw Cabin in the Woods. N- oh my god, really? Is it Eli Roth? No, that's Cabin that Fever. One. Cabin Fever. Cabin in the Woods, directed by Drew Goddard, written by. Uh, Joss Whedon and Drew Goddard. Drew Goddard, the showrunner for Daredevil, season one and two of Daredevil on Netflix, as well as he directed uh, Cloverfield and um, the first Cloverfield. And yeah. he did a couple other things, too, that were really good. Okay. Cabin in the Woods is a must-see. Yeah. Well, I'll check you it like out. horror movies? Ah, they're all right. They're, they're generally kind of boring. All right. Cabin in the Woods. You'll, it's, it's a good time, I promise. Yeah. It depends on what what type of horror it is because horror now is just startling Every- where it's just, you know, loud noise with something visually shocking and uh it's not it's scary. Some, it's focused on being fun. Yeah. That's and better. It like I, did you ever see explains the tropes of horror movies? Tucker and Dale versus evil. Yeah. Is it similar to that? Less uh parody. It's not as goof. It's not nearly as goofy as that movie is. Yeah. It's it's serious. It's think of the the t- uh, a slightly more lighthearted Evil Dead One. Okay. I guess in terms of tone. Yeah. Um. It's also very heavily inspired by Evil Dead, which, um, I love Evil Dead. That's my Star Wars. That's your Star Wars. So oh, that, yeah. that's your, it's, it's that's, overrated and too many people like it. No, no, no. That's my childhood, uh, s- franchise that gotcha. I have a, um, unhealthy attachment to. Yeah. Mine's Terminator 2. That's a good one. Mm-hmm. That's a good one to have. I watched that every day when I was four for like a year and a half straight. I watched Army of Darkness every day when I was eight. Yeah. For, yeah. So. Back to Kingsman. We keep getting sidetracked here. Kingsman 1. Yeah. It was similar to Cabin Fever in what way? Or, uh, Cabin it's in the Woods. It's similar to Cabin Fever in the sense that in Kingsman 2, they go into a cabin. <laughs> and he throws cologne at the bad guys. It, it's, it's just, I, I see it as that sort of because it, it, it's a love letter to all the old spy movies, but at the same time, a hate letter to like, We've been doing these tropes and these cliches for like what fifty years now. Let's yeah. let's shake things up. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was really smartly done in that sense. I thought the subversions of it were 
very clever. And I thought the pacing of it, I always, the pacing is so good. It's yeah. one of those things where, like an Edgar Wright movie, if, if, if it, if I catch it in the corner of the room or something, mm-hmm. I can be engrossed in it almost instantly because of the way it's paced and the transitions of it. And I thought it had a really healthy sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like constantly hitting jokes, but it was, it was lighthearted enough to where it was fun. I really enjoy the camera work in the first one too. Like the way yes. they, they film fight scenes and things like that. The way that the camera is kind of alive. Similar, you know what it reminds me of is, uh, Super Mario 64, the camera where it just kind of is like okay. tracking everything that's happening, but not like, not statically, you know, it's not just spinning. Super Mario, in a circle. What's the last game you played? 64? I've played Is that games. the last game you've played? No, but just the idea, cause it, so in Super Mario, the, the camera guy is floating on a cloud, right? And so he's, he's moving up and down, like, like in my head, watching the Kingsman, the guy from Super Mario 4, or Super Mario 64 is, is the, the cameraman. Cloud. Yeah. It's the, the, the Koopa on the, the cloud. Or is it Koopa? Is it, who's, I can't even remember who's filming that. Doesn't matter. It's a, it's a Koopa of some kind, I think. And uh, that's who filmed Kingsman 1. Okay. And that's in the credits? Yeah. You don't remember that? Coop, Koopa, Koopa Troopa in, as cameraman? Head, yep. Lead, lead camera? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Don't you but pay yeah, attention? Yeah, the camera is great. Like the way it <laughs> it follows the action and the way it, even within action scenes, the way it like transitions from your focus from one place to another yeah. where... Like, Eggsy sh- has his umbrella thing at the end of the movie, and he shoots a guy in the head with it. And the guy flies across the room, and the camera follows that guy, and then that guy hits the wall. But then there's another guy coming out of the corner with a sniper rifle. And it's like, all this stuff is going on, but it's so focused yeah. and streamlined. And it feels chaotic, but you know everything that's happening. Yeah. You as get opposed to, see to Ready Player happening. One, where... <laughs> There, every every scene, every image is so dense that you you can't. It, it does so much on there. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you're looking at. Like they're just like they just throw up in your eyes and say that it, action is happening. I thought that was distracting because there were so many times where I was like, "Wait, was that a Navi? Wait, was that Ryu? Wait, was that this character?" And, and where that's I, what I the wasn't whole movie focusing, was. Yeah, but I was like, I, they were on screen for such a short amount of time that I was like, wait, was that who I thought it was? See, I hated and that then, so much until I noticed something that I liked. Like when the Iron Giant fell in the lava and gave a thumbs up, which is a, a an homage to Terminator 2. Like, I was yeah, like, oh, that, that, that felt special. Done. No, I know, I know. But I was like, that felt special to me where everything else felt annoying. So I was like, I guess... That other stuff that I found annoying probably resonated with someone else, so it worked in that way. I was waiting for, for an Evil Dead reference. I didn't get one, so that movie sucks. <laughs> uh, this movie doesn't have an Evil Dead reference. <laughs> Awful. Uh, yeah, so like, I feel like Kingsman 1, the fighting style, is what Black Panther should have been. Not shaky cam, yeah, like not quick cuts. Stylized. But yeah, like you can see everything happening. You get to watch, you know, everything happening. Not... Because there's no shaky cam in the Kingsman, right? No, not really. It's it's If it's shaky, it's done in a, a deliberate sort of way. Yeah. It's all cloud it's movement. Cloud movement. Yeah, I like the term. <laughs> cloud movement. Like it, it just never, yeah. the camera never felt stuck in one place. It felt very much alive. Yeah. Even when two characters are just talking, they, they, there's still a lot of uh, dynamism, I suppose. Yeah. Is probably the wrong word. But I mean, <laughs> there's the scene when, when Colin Firth goes to talk to Samuel L. Jackson and they're in his mansion eating McDonald's. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hate, I thought that was so drinking. dumb. I did not like that. Oh, I love that. It's just like. Not even poor people like, would serve McDonald's as like a treat. I thought it was a fun little, little gag because 
you in these movies, it's always the same. He goes, they have the dinner, there's tension, but now it's McDonald's, right? <laughs> yeah, it's but it's like I don't know if KFC would have been too racist, but uh, I feel like KFC <laughs> would have made more sense. Like that, that like the bucket, De- that's like a, <laughs> that the bucket is a uh, that's like a party thing, right? Like. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you would never just show up with a bag of burgers from McDonald's and be like, here, I brought food for the party. But bring in, like, a yeah. KFC meal, that's, like, a more reasonable step. That is true, because it's, it's just in a bucket. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, to me, but I, but I feel like they wouldn't do it because Samuel Jackson was black, and uh, everybody loves fried chickens. So that's not really reasonable to attribute. Same with, this is another issue I have, the rainbow... And the gay community. That's not fair. You can't just co-op things that everyone gets to enjoy. Every color. They get every color now. I think the gays should have one color. <laughs> and we get one color. <laughs> it's only fair. But yeah. they get every color on the spectrum. Yeah, that's not right. Excuse me? Where's my colors? And it's, it's oh, not- I don't need them because I'm so <laughs> fucking privileged. Am I right? <laughs> Getting a lot of use out of the bell. And it's not even that I don't think they should have a symbol, but like, I don't know. I feel like if, if heterosexuals were like, you know what? We claim the sky. Suck it. Like no one would be on yeah. board with that. You know, it's like you can't just take something as a, a mascot that is just universal. Yeah. I, yeah. But you don't see me asking for a white history month or a, what else? What else could we push for that that we don't need? Um, just to make things even. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, give me a white history year. There you go. Remind me. Yeah, we you, you, the Jewish people don't need a Jewish history month in in Germany for the. I mean, that was pretty bad. What happened over there? Do you remember that? Did you hear about that? What in Germany? Yeah. Th- did you hear about that? Uh, let's see. I feel super uncomfortable making any jokes about the Holocaust. <laughs> I don't no, know I'm where, just asking if you know, know about the to go. Holocaust. Oh, not about the Holocaust? Have you heard about the Holocaust? I have heard about the Holocaust. I saw Schindler's List a long time ago. Yeah. There's a movie. I'm not going to make any, any Holocaust jokes. I'm just asking <laughs> if you know about it. I do know about it. Do you know people, Listen, I would, a lot of people in Thailand don't think it happened. Oh, you know, I, <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. I, I, uh, I've seen images of things in Thailand. I've seen it, uh, like a, a cartoon drawn Teletubby uh-huh. with, uh, Hitler's face on it and it's got a swastika on top of its antenna. Yep. There's a band that dresses like, up like Nazis. It's like a rock band, like a punk rock band here that will dress up as Nazis. But they have no idea not, what they're doing. Yeah, not really. Like, as far as I'm that's aware. That's kind of fascinating. Yeah. The most offend- offended I've ever been at a t-shirt, I was at the beach in uh, Thailand, and there was a guy that had a picture of Osama bin Laden, and on the back was the two towers where one was on fire and one was falling, and it said <laughs> it said something wow. about, like, death to America or something like on a shirt, and I was like, what on earth? One, who made this shirt? How did this ever become <laughs> a thing? Two... What does this guy think he's wearing? Like, does he just not care? Yeah. Or is he like legit? Like, yeah, that's right. America finally got theirs. Like, that ain't cool. Yeah, I I've worn a lot of wacky shirts, and I I, I love my shirts, but I, uh, that one is it's too far. <laughs> yeah, a bit. And, and that's coming from me. <laughs> and I good. I love a good nine eleven joke. Every once in a while, I think everything's on the table in terms of humor yeah but But there's like if if you're black tease me for being white i don't care it's fine do it you know Mm -hmm. there's a difficulty levels to jokes though i think similar to like in the olympics when you're on the high dive like they they say like this joke or this this dive is worth this amount of points right the difficulty level you could you can attain a 10 if you land this correctly but also if you slightly mess up you're definitely gonna really fail. And, uh. Yeah. That's how jokes are. That's true. You can't, you can't make a lazy 9-11 joke. You can't just 
add fart sounds to uh, the video or the whack, hits whack, the building. wackety yeah. sacks to the video of all the, the stuff happening. Like, that's not a good joke. Is this the longest you've gone or the most you've gone not talking about the movie you're supposed oh, to talk no. about on no. this podcast? No, it happens okay. all the time. Well, that's the thing. Kingsman is something I'd actually really like to talk about. Yeah. I, I'm very, uh, I guess the word is tangential. I, my, uh, my brain is always getting pulled to other things. I think, I, so I think you should do an experiment. Okay. Get the 9-11 footage, put wackety sacks to it, and upload it on your channel. Okay. See what the, okay. <laughs> the response is. What's up, everybody? Is. It's me, <laughs> your favorite little terrorist in the globe. <laughs> Did you hear about Count uh, Dooku? Count, not Dooku, uh, uh, Count, oh, what's his name? The, 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 the pug guy, the Nazi pug guy. The Nazi pub guy? Pug, P-U-G. What? What does that mean? The dog, P-U-G, pug. From what? <laughs> From YouTube. What are you talking about? Do you know the... D- what? You, oh, you, oh, Count Dankula. Dankula. You, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Count Dooku. I thought you were going to say some... <laughs> Star Wars. An thing. actor from Star Wars. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's I've crazy, of, right? Yeah, it's um, it's definitely worrying, I think. That's why we definitely, left. Definitely. Yeah. We, he, he's in Britain. That's what I'm saying. Were you in Britain? No, but we're American. That's why we Brexited, right? Yeah. Back in the day. Okay. The original Brexit. Yeah, the T one with the T tea time. All right. Over the- <laughs> Kingsman. <laughs> Speaking back of track. British, let's go back to Kingsman. See, we can thread it all together. There into you one go. Smooth, cohesive podcast. Yeah. I think that's part uh, of, uh, part of the Kingsman's charm. Is, at least in America, there's this idea that if you're British, you're more, uh, put together, more well to do, I guess. And, especially uh, that upper class type of British. Yeah. And this really plays with that. This is like almost poking fun at that idea. Not so much at them, but at the idea of like, no, they're just normal people, guys. Like, get over it. Just cause they, they have an accent doesn't mean they're, extra special or they don't have weird thoughts or do weird stuff. Yeah. Unless you're nitpicks. Oh. The worst. Which in that case they're they're weird. That is true. They're always so sweaty. But- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what are the greasy a couple of greasers? <laughs> but I the first Kingsman, I said it in my video, which mm-hmm. by the way, I made a video about Kingsman 2, the the Golden Suck. And, you know, I don't, I'm not going to brag. It's, it's, it's that, you know, it's about as popular as Ray William Johnson's channel. How about the tune of 400,000 views? That's like, uh, Devin Sweeney video right there. If you don't know who that is, check him out. Um, so yeah, I made it because I love the first Kingsman. Yeah. I, it was my favorite movie of that year. Hands down, because it's everything I look for in a movie, really. Which is, what do you look for in a movie? Like, what do you, what's the best thing a movie can do for you? Is this a hypothetical question to the audience, or are you asking me directly? To you. Okay. For, and the audience can, let us know down in the comments. <laughs> uh, for, what, do you, what do you think? For me, my biggest thing is I want to get lost in the story. I want to by that these people are real and the choices they're making make sense. The world, okay. the world can be as crazy and ridiculous as they want to do it. As long as they make the characters grounded in that world. Like you can have, you know, like Lord of the Rings, right? That world is nothing like ours, but yet the characters feel legitimate even inside of they that world. You yeah. You, you can follow it. You can think about it. That's, that's my goal. Anytime they do something that takes me out of that, it just, it, it annoys me. It, it frustrates me. Like the you, Kingsman. You know what would be weird? What's that? Is if Gandalf, if they were walking through the woods and Gandalf stepped on a landmine. <laughs> that would be weird. Yeah. The, but okay, what I look for in a movie, just quickly so <laughs> that 
we can all understand why Kingsman one was just so magical is to be swept away. Cause I'm always, uh, the type of person who's, I can't turn off my brain. I'm always thinking, I can't sleep at night. Cause I'm thinking when a movie comes on, I'm going, Oh, that continuity wasn't right. That that was a bad choice for the character. This doesn't make sense. This and this, all I look for in a movie is something that takes me out of my own brain for an hour and a half. If a movie can make me forget that I exist, I consider that a successful movie. And that's really all I want. Yeah. I yeah. And I would say that's away. what I was saying. I'd, I'd say that we're on the same page. Okay. And, and Kingsman one did that for me with its, its pacing and the action. That church scene was so good. So well done. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. And when, when I was going into the second one, I watched one trailer. I kept my expectations as low as I possibly could. Yeah. And I, when I was walking to the theater, I said, I hope to my girlfriend, I said, I hope they don't try to top the church scene because that would be vain. And I feel like the whole movie actually, in hindsight, was probably trying to top the church scene. Yeah. Just in terms of absurdity. Well, I think they want you to watch them back to back. I think they will. Uh, they clearly do because in the opening of the movie, um, Eggsy's outside of the Kingsman shop and Charlie walks up to him with a gun. Yeah. And I had seen Kingsman two or three times at that point. The first one. Yeah. Which is super rare for me. I don't rewatch movies. I don't think you do either. No, not really. Typically you watch it once and you get everything out of it that, that you're going to get out of it. Yeah. I either really enjoy so, it. So I don't want to ruin that experience or I did not like yeah. it and I don't care to watch it again. It's generally. So when Charlie walks up to Eggsy, I didn't know who that was. Yeah, me either. I Despite had no being idea. Very familiar. Even though, even when they scanned his face and showed who it was, I was yeah, just like, I don't, I don't remember this guy. Am I supposed to know who this is? Like, I thought, oh, this is, this is a new character that they're going to establish later. Yeah, that's but what I thought. It was just someone who was like, so I thought he's established in the world, but not to the audience. And so they're going to have to do some makeup work to tell you who he is later. But when they t- yeah. explained who it is, I was like, oh, I should have known that. And you guys did not do a good job. And w- so they start fighting in the car. And I was, uh, it's like I said in my video, I felt already distanced from this because I didn't know who he was, why they were fighting, who he was with. It, it wasn't a good introduction to the movie, I don't think. Like, Austin Powers has a great, great introduction where, you know, the little musical number and there's all the dancing and singing. They, they, they let you know, they ease you into the Austin Powers experience. Yeah. But, but and the first Kingsman did it really well too. They just, establishing characters. They didn't have this flashy, snappy intro. They just, the movie just starts and, it builds Colin Firth and Eggsy's characters, and it's not till about twenty minutes in that we get the proper action scene in the bar, where it's kind of slowly been building to that, where this movie doesn't build up to anything; it just starts. Yeah. At it, I think I said that in my video. It starts at a ten, and it doesn't deserve. It didn't ever work its way up there. Well, if they would have started it, a minute later, it would have been fine too. Like if the movie yeah, like t- opened, talk to each other and set something up. Well, not even that. Like if the movie would have opened with them fighting in the car, I think that would have been a better way to start the movie than to have him walk out slow. Like they establish this real lackadaisical pace and then they give you whiplash by throwing you into it. If they would have opened up with him fighting in the car, it would have been a much more reasonable, uh, jumping off point into the movie. Yeah, there, there's literally a, a million things they could have done with it. I, I, what are your issues, main, your main issues with Kingsman 2? Two. Two. Uh, my main issues is that they, they lost the heart of the first one. They, they exactly. like, they lost what was made it special and they tried to redo that. 
the first one was so good because they didn't just try to remake something else. They're like, you know what? We're going to play with the form, but we're going to, we're going to do our own thing. We're going to subvert your expectations. We're going to be outrageous and be not more realistic, but more, I guess more real in this world, right? Like if you have a James Bond character, the James Bond. Uh oh. James Bond comparison. <laughs> Go if on. You, it's going to be way more violent and way more aggressive than the James Bond movies put it forward. It's kind of toned down when you watch those. And then when you watch this, even though it's hyper stylized, it is more accurate to the violence. Like that, again, like the church fight scene in the first one. It's like there's, you know, people getting stabbed, people getting shot in the head, and blood all over the place, and like people are getting tired and hurt, and like it feels yeah. more gritty. And that never, you never really get that with James Bond. Well, in the second one, they're just like, let's just do everything that worked in the first one again, because that's what people want to see. People want to see these action takes, or these action scenes that are one shot. And these cool gadgets. Not and really. Yeah, th- that had nothing to do with what made the first one good. It was only about them subverting your your expectations. Well, I'm glad you brought up uh, James Bond because I, in my video, I made a couple of comparisons to James Bond. Yeah. And everybody is telling me, this ain't that kind of movie, prof. They're <laughs> saying to me that my... This is something that has come up a lot. Yeah. That... My comparing it to James Bond is incorrect and wrong because this movie is trying to subvert James Bond. And I understand that. But my point was exactly what yours is, which is that me making James Bond comparisons is me saying that this movie has not stayed true to its roots. Yeah. It's not being respectful to itself or the genre. Wait, which, which one? The, the first, first one, or the second was. one? Yeah, 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 the first one was. The first one, yeah, the first one is a James Bond movie. I mean, yeah. you, you take away all the goofy elements. It's essentially a James Bond movie. You know, you have your, your spy, you have your, your gadget guy, you have your mission with a, uh, outlandish villain. Like all this stuff, the, the, the plot of, the villain's plot, all of it. Would fit in a James Bond movie if you took away the glitter. You took away all the pizzazz that, uh, the king has been yeah. added, you know, that it's, it's essentially they even directly say that to the camera in at some point in the movie. Yeah. This isn't that Pretty kind much. of movie or something like where he says, I love a, I love a good far fetched plot where the, with the, you know, yeah, where the villain like tells everything and then he says, this isn't that kind yeah. of movie and shoots Colin Firth right in the face. And I, I like, love. I like that. I like that they were willing to kill Colin Firth. And, uh, they really spit in your face about that when, uh, they bring him back to life. I've seen a lot of comments. Okay. A lot of ideas from probably these 12 year olds that have su- such much better ideas than Matthew Vaughn or whoever was in charge had, which is, let's say, what if Colin Firth's glasses were bulletproof? I'd, I'd buy that. Right? Yeah. If they got a bulletproof tux, why not? Or what if, cause Samuel L. Jackson didn't like violence, couldn't stand the sight of blood. Since he wasn't even looking at Colin Firth when he pulled the trigger, it's possible he grazed Colin Firth's head and, and knocked him unconscious. Like, these are ideas that, that I'm getting from 12 year olds that are better than what actually happened in the movie, which is, let's get this device that we wrap around their head that that <laughs> wolverines and cures their fucking bullet that went through their brain yeah. and 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 mends it i mean it it would have been great if colin firth was just there in his tux in in imprisoned and they they see him and they come to save him and he comes out and he's like thank god you're here i've been waiting for you i, th- I thought you got my messages or whatever yeah yeah like that would have been it still would have been disrespectful to bring him back at all. Yeah. I here's but, but he, they could have done it a million different ways that would have not been so upsetting. Yeah, this is what I would have done. I was thinking about this morning. I would go back 
to the first Kingsman when they made it. You'd have to have the plan to do this in the second one. You couldn't. That's okay. the only way it works. But <clears throat> Right, because they never planned on bringing him back. I don't yeah. think they planned on doing a sequel. Yeah, I, I don't know about the sequel part, but they definitely didn't intend to bring him back. There's no way that ever crossed anyone's mind. I'd be shocked if it did. But let's say you did have that plan. Samuel L. Jackson shoots him right in the face, POV. That's all you see. In the second one, you find out that he's still alive and they're trying to figure out how it happened. What happened was he took his glasses off and Samuel L. Jackson shot right through the camera, not in his face. Colin Firth turns out to be the bad guy. You get rid of Whiskey being the double agent. Colin Firth is oh. a double agent, survives, and is the bad guy in number three. Oh. Having him be the bad guy would be the perfect ending to the arc, I think, for yeah. Jesse. Yeah, I think so. Like, cause that, that is also kind of Star Wars because, um, Matthew Vaughn, the director, uh-huh. always relates these Kingsman movies to Star Wars for some reason. And Colin Firth is essentially Eggsy's father in the movie. It's his father figure. Yeah. And having him be the villain at the end that he has to defeat is, is really very Star Wars. The, yeah. The I am your father. Yeah. That would actually, um, that's risky though. That's oh, like, yeah. you know, like you really have to put so much care and effort into pulling that off properly. Yeah. But, but they already have that's very interesting. the double agent character, right? You have Whiskey betraying everyone. You have Colin Firth surviving something. Make those two characters one. And Colin Firth is trying to take down the Kingsmen. He's trying to take down the Statesmen. Like he's just trying to dismantle everything for whatever reason, like give him a legitimate reason to do it, but still make him wrong. You know, like that's, that's one of the things that these movies today don't do well is giving the villain a legitimate reason to do it. I think Samuel L. Jackson was somewhat sympathetic towards that, but I thought that was, they did that really well. Yeah. But okay. not, he, what's the woman's name in the second one? Julianne Moore. Julianne Poppy. Moore. That, I never felt like she had any good intentions. Well, she didn't. It's hard to give somebody enough character when they only have 15 minutes of screen time in a yeah. two and a half hour long movie. Yeah. And I'm also, her, her, I'm also yeah. sick of Samuel the, Jackson thought he was saving the world and yeah. she just wanted to move back to America. Well, he also convinced all the world's leaders, what he was doing was going to save the world. he had that charisma. World. Yeah. That lisp was a bad choice, but the charisma was there for sure. I love the lisp. I, I thought that really... The lisp. It, it, I thought that enhanced it. Oh, it made it so much worse. It was so distracting. I thought it was, as, it was as much fun as Brad Pitt's accent in Inglorious Bastards. That was like so distracting. Of... It was so cartoonish. I love that. No, I... I really, I didn't really like Inglorious Bastards overall. What? Yeah, I was disappointed. That's my favorite Tauntaun movie, Tarantanto. <laughs> if it would, that's like, my favorite one. I love the story, the idea of all of it. I think it could have been so cool if it was, if it felt realistic. I, I thought it felt realistic within no. the world. No, it, no, it didn't. You know, wait. So you have. We've looped it back to the Holocaust again. Yeah. Yeah. You've heard of the Holocaust. I have. Hitler died in real life. Did you know that? Yeah, but he shot himself. That's what the papers say. He didn't get, yeah, and he, he didn't get shot a million times from a Tommy gun while the movie theater was burning down. No, but that's satisfying to see. Uh, not really. And that's what I liked about it because the whole time I'm thinking, well, obviously they don't kill Hitler because he killed himself, but then, they kill him in the movie, and I thought that was a nice surprise. Yeah, but the it it was goofy. Yeah, well, it's Tarantino. That's <laughs> He's what I'm saying. Kind of goofy. That's what I'm saying. I felt like if it wasn't a Tarantino film, it could have been so much better. Like, imagine the story of Band of Brothers shot like Saving Private Ryan. Okay, listen. What? What did I say? Those Band of Brothers, the same people, and, and Glorious Bastard. Imagine and Glorious Bastards shot in the same style of Saving Private Ryan. The story. I don't know. Like uh, that. I don't it would have been so good. I, I think it would have been too serious for its own good. I, 
I. It's I, okay I, to have seriousness. I really like seriousness is good sometimes, especially when you're dealing with war, especially when you're dealing with the Holocaust. But I think World War Two has been done so much that it's nice to have an alternate style of it. Yeah, I don't. I don't really enjoy anything that goes and rewrites history like that. I think it's always kind of boring. Really? I, I think yeah. history itself is boring because we already know it's going to happen. I like when, when you think, I like when things shake up. Like if, if we go, if you time, like a movie would time travel back into World War II or something and do so, some stupid stuff. Nah, like, cause I'd like, be into that. like I said, like, uh, so Band of Brothers is great, right? Uh, Saving Private Ryan is yeah, great. Yeah, it's got Ross. Ross from Friends is in there. <laughs> Bad Brothers. Schwimmer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Saving Private Ryan is great. Hacksaw Ridge is pretty good. Um, most war movies are really good if they're, if they're handled well. So I, I, I disagree with it. History is boring because we know what's going to happen. You have these. These stories of these guys doing these amazing things and telling them honestly is so engaging. So when you go and you take the framework of those war movies and you put it into a cartoon like in Glorious Bastards, it's just like, oh, this is, I'd rather go watch Saving Private Ryan again. Well, I don't think Inglorious Bastards tried to depict any real world battles no i think it, it exists in its own universe you know yeah it definitely does Where but it, it's based off it's of not like trying story, to pay respect to anything i don't I'm think i'm pretty think it's sure just, it's based off of a, a, an actual group of guys okay i Is i it? think i think i could be wrong but I, I believe the the squad the uh the jewish guys who are hunting down nazis I believe that. Jewicide squad. The Jewicide squad. Jewicide squad. <laughs> but that's like, what we'll call it. don't, would you rather, if, say it is based on a true story, what movie is better? The actual account and the true story of all that happening or Inglorious Bastards? What would you rather watch? Inglorious Bastards. Nah, that's Bar wrong. None. You're wrong. Fundamentally. Who's directing the real one? Uh, Tom Hanks. Oh, s- he directed that? What? You're asking me who, who's, who's directing, directing the, the hypothetical one? Yeah. So I said Tom Hanks. And then you said he directed that? I thought, okay, you know what? <laughs> he did not direct the hypothetical one. But in the hypothetical situation, he is going to direct it. Can he? Oh, yeah. Has he directed anything before? Uh, I'm pretty sure he, like, Produced Band of Brothers and uh, the Pacific yeah, and all produced. that. Yeah, produced. The Pacific was kind of bad. I never I saw it. I couldn't. I couldn't sit through it. Speaking of not being able to sit through things, <laughs> apparently the first cut of the Kingsman, and I can't. I don't know how I missed this, but a lot of commenters tell me that the first cut of the. Kingsman, the Golden Circle, was four hours long. Oof. I uh, I started watching it, the Golden Circle, and I saw that it was two hours and twenty minutes, and I was like, oh, "Nope, I'm good. I don't need." It feels to. longer. Yeah, it definitely does. And it th- that movie is so bad on a second watch because it's just boring. Like, there's so much. That doesn't need to be there, and it's just so bloated with nonsense. And it, it, and then you're just waiting for like, oh my god, this is the scene where they get in the ski lift and it starts spinning in a circle. <laughs> yeah, I remember this. <laughs> it's like th- there's nothing good about it. Yeah, and uh, the action scenes are good, but for the most part, like they're doing well, a magic trick. A- it's like if you see the cup and balls trick. Four times in a row, it really starts to lose its flair. The the action scenes are better out of context than they are in context. Like yeah. when I was, I was scrubbing through before I did my video and just watching the action scenes, uh-huh. and I thought, oh, these are pretty fun. And then I watched the movie, and when they come up in the movie, they just they're not organic to the plot in any way, no. and it 
it takes away from them a lot. The, the, I think the, the car fight is good. And when they storm Poppy's base, that's pretty good. But, but right before they storm Poppy's base, Eggsy steps on a landmine. So, <laughs> like, I'm already pissed off. And now, and, and now you got John, what's his name? I was going to, Johnny Cash. Looking into the camera, um, Elton John. Elton John, yeah, Elton John's really bad. He didn't <laughs> if they got Elton zero Johnny sense. Cash in the movie, that would have been impressive. <laughs> well, so the Colin first story arc, right? He gets shot in the face in the first one. They save him, bring him back to life, and he has amnesia. My theory uh-huh. is that they never intended to bring Colin Firth back. That Exy exactly. was was going to save Merlin, and Merlin was going to be the one with amnesia and they just what so merlin the, the bald guy was going to yeah. end up with amnesia and that was going to be the oh. from the explosion or something like that okay so through different means he just... yeah yeah so another way okay. he, he was going to, he was going to be the one with amnesia because you think about the two characters who is more likely to have a a butterfly collection Pee-wee. I don't know who Pee-wee is. Herman. Yeah, no, uh, the bald guy, bald boy. Merlin. Ba- Butterfly bald boy. Right? Doesn't it seem like they, yeah. they're like, they wrote that story for his character and they're like, well, maybe Colin Firth is back in. Let's, let's just use that storyline and put him in there. Like Merlin being so weak and so like scared and just pathetic adds up to his character. That's- but they're like, it just feels like they were able to get Colin Firth back. So they just, you know, copy and pasted his name over Merlin's and just used that. That's possible. It, because Merlin, or I get them confused. Bald boy. Merlin, he, yeah, yeah. He didn't, he wasn't the like wizard a, of the round an incredibly table. well-established character no. in the first movie. He He was there and he was cool and he was good, but... If they were to do that to him, it wouldn't feel so disrespectful. Yeah. And it, where I, with Colin Firth, the, the biggest issue of it is it's a major regression for his character. And that's not what you want in yeah. any movie. That's like a big no no. Yeah. Is to take your character and, and they literally take him three steps back. And his arc is to become, to get to the point where he was in the beginning of the first movie. Which we've already seen him at that level. We need to. There's no growth for him. Just, yeah. And it's just so disrespectful. He literally says, "I want my mommy." <laughs> yeah. At some point. Yeah. I want mother. Yeah, I want mother. Oh my god! Like who? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think when Colin, I think Colin Firth coming back threw a wrench into the script that they had. I think that. Uh, Merlin was going to be the one in a coma. I think, um, uh, what's his name? The, oh, this is going to drive me crazy. Why can't I? Channing Tatum. Yes. Thank you. Channing Tatum was going to have a much bigger role and Colin yeah. Firth kind of took that place. Well, what, what I've read, and uh-huh. I don't think it's true. Okay. Is that, um, Channing Tatum had a scheduling conflict with Logan Lucky, which oh, okay. I looked up the filming dates for The Kingsman and Logan Lucky, and there's only one month of overlap, yeah. if I remember correctly. And I don't think they would wait. I mean, when when they, they schedule these things out, there's a guy there's with a plan with all these actors' schedules and upcoming movies and agencies and things yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's what happened at all. Yeah. Yeah, so, no. I, but that's the rumor, mm-hmm. and I, I I dug into that. I did a lot of research for the video, um, but that, that makes me. That reminds me, I I got a question for you. Yeah. Do you think that it was studio interference or or not? Yes, in the aspect it, it, of saying we need to make a second one. Saying that, like, kind that of we need rushing to do a sequel. it, yeah, rushing it, and then and getting Colin have... Firth back. 
the yeah the Firth, the Tates, the Bridges. So but basically, what they I'm did told- with the second one, oh, okay, is that it is the fourth and fifth Kingsman story put into the second one. Everything that what? they're what do you mean? Everything fourth that they're fifth. What do you mean by that? Everything that they're doing is stuff that you're doing to well-established characters, right? So if you really want to destroy Colin Firth's character and make him this weak guy, you need a few movies of him being really strong for that to land, right? Imagine if Colin Firth was in the second and the third where his character was so stoic and uh, was able to maintain or like handle any situation that came at him. Then in the fourth movie, Mm -hmm. he's broken down. Well, now it means something, right? Like, and now it's, it, it has an impact because you've seen him multiple times like this and now he's, he's different. But going yeah. from one to two I, and doing that, it doesn't work. I agree with that. And then adding in the- You need st- time to, to build with them. And yeah, okay. Yeah. And then adding in the statesman, that's like the last ditch effort of a dying thing, right? Like that's, that's almost jumping the shark bad of if you think that's bad i got a prediction for the third one yeah i think they're going to introduce the chinaman the chinese portion of the statesman <laughs> so that they can appeal to the chinese audience i i Definitely, have a theory that that's what they're going to do no way it's going to be called the chinaman though no but what else can you call it <laughs> i don't know <laughs> that's there's no way uh yeah, I I can well, see can that see happening. Jeff Bridges going, oh, that China means coming in. Is uh Jackie right? Chan going to be the one? D- yeah, they get Jackie Jackie Chan. Um, they'll get uh who else is there? Donnie Yen. Yeah. Uh, everybody that's in the trailer for the Meg, all those three Chinese. Oh my goodness, that looks awful. <laughs> I was so I upset when I watched that. that. I was so upset when I watched that. I didn't that. know what it was. Because it's called The Meg. I thought yeah. it was a romantic comedy about a woman named Meg. Yeah. And it's fucking Megalodon. Yeah. Chasing Jason Statham. It oh makes my God. zero sense tonally, the trailer. <laughs> Jason Statham is playing himself in movies. Well, it's, the exact it's clearly same character. A, to appeal to China. Like half the, the top billed actors in that are Chinese. Yeah. People I haven't heard of, but they're trying to appeal to China for that China money. So I think Kingsman 3 is going to have the Chinaman in it. I uh, I hope I'm wrong. I really <laughs> don't want that to be the case. I don't have anything against China. It I, sure sounds I like don't you do. Think I, I, what I have against China is the fact that it, it's not China's fault. It's Hollywood's fault. But it's also China's fault for going to see Transformers 4 and things like that. But at the same time, they, in terms of movies, it's, it's all pretty new to them. So they don't really know any better. It's like, you know, imagine you've only seen a small handful of movies that are really cheap and garbage. And then you see Transformers 4, which is this like experience, this, all these explosions and it looks great, you know, in, in context of, of what they've seen. So. I, so actually, I have a theory about it. It's not their it. fault. <laughs> it's Hollywood's fault, but... Well, I think that <sighs> what the problem is, is... uh So living in Thailand, I've seen a lot of movies, like even uh, American-made movies, but with Thai dub over it, and then like reading the okay. subtitles and stuff. You will put a lot more effort uh as the viewer into connecting with the characters what they're doing why they're doing it giving them motivation behind everything because you can't understand what they're saying so even if you're reading it oh you're you're way more invested and so the over the top like the the more pandering the more uh the less nuance just everything being just kind of slammed in your face works much better when you can't understand what's being said because then it gives you more room to build the story and like make things make sense. And so internationally, these movies are doing better because there's no nuance. It's just up in your face. 
you see what's going on and then you write the story in your head. Oh, he's doing this because of that reason. He's doing that because of this reason. But when you're the native okay. speaker of the language, you're watching it and you're like, oh, this is, this is really bad. This is really lazy. This is, there, there's zero nuance. There's, it's not interesting. There's no depth, but that's all I think intentional because it works better internationally. That makes sense. But but when you want to make a movie intentionally international, there's a certain amount of dumbing down that you need to do so that it applies to all languages. Mm-hmm. For and and yeah, that's what I'm saying. When you are reading the subtitles, you uh, it's harder to catch the product placement. It's less distracting, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You you don't. But that's a very interesting perspective on it. You don't get slapped in the face as much with bad things like so the reason okay. the originally taylor and i had a different podcast before we started i seen that uh it was called what the dub and we watched okay. american horse american horror story the first season but dubbed in mm-hmm. german and we would talk about it because we neither one of us had seen the original and we watched it dubbed in german then we would talk about what we thought happened and we came up with these like really complex ideas about why they're doing this and doing that and like giving them backstory that they never had. Then we went back and watched it in English. So you wind up giving it more credit than it deserves. A ton more. And when we watched it back in English, we were just like, oh, this is not a good show. It sucks. sucks. (laughs) Season eight. Greenlit. Beautiful. I've I've only watched the first. Gave up. Wait, I don't know. Is it season eight? My girlfriend likes it. She, oh my god, I can't stand it. It's really bad. They had Precious in season three as a witch. That was pretty funny. <laughs> Gabori Sidibe, her name is. But uh, uh, yeah, so the Golden Circle. What what do you find offensive about it? Almost everything. Yeah. I I I feel it is passionless, which we, the first one was was very passionate, yeah. and it it. Matthew Vaughn, the director, says he he said he was trying so hard to avoid sequelitis. He was trying not to not to fall into the traps that all sequels fall into, and he it did. Everything this movie just reformulated the first one, beat for beat. Yeah, and um, giving Eggsy a girlfriend, like a proper girlfriend, just. It, I, I appreciate the attempt at trying something new, yeah. but it didn't work in this movie. Maybe if, if you reworked the movie a lot, a little more. And also if, if it wasn't her, like she does, she's not a good bond girl, if you will. Yeah. She's, they don't have any charisma or any chemistry. And I also, in the first movie, she could barely speak English. And now in this one, she's whatever. That's, that's a, that's a nitpick. Yeah. But in this movie, she can speak perfect English. So, <laughs> movie, I don't think that worked and that bloats the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Then no, it, it, she, got, her character was useless in this film. Yeah. I, I get, I'm pretty tired of there always needing to be a romantic angle a in romance. every single movie. Cause it's, it's not necessary. I thought, I thought that uh, Ready Player One's romance was really forced, but I guess there was yeah. a romance in the book. St- still, it it didn't work with the movie. So the book is awful. I, I don't, I'm assuming you haven't read it. Nope. The book is terrible. People love it for some reason, but I, I don't think people think about well, what they're reading. Well, they love the recognition. Yeah. The brand recognition. Yeah. Uh, but I, from what I remember, the love story in that is... They're flirting throughout the video game, and at the very end, they finally meet each other, and they're like, "We should kind of date or whatever." Like that, that that seemed like the, at most the commitment. I could be That's wrong. Fine, that sounds okay. Yeah, uh, but the movie, he's like, "I love you." In twenty minutes in, twenty he drops min- the "I love you." Yeah, it's insane. Oh my god, it's so. Bad. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I got this. This Amecus cube. It it rewinds time sixty seconds. Okay, use it. <laughs> all right, we used it. Um, now there's no danger at all. Uh, the bad guys that 
broken. They're not outside the building or anything. They didn't have a perimeter. We're safe. It's a, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Nothing matters. Also, why not just take off your headset? That was my thought. Like, if you're if if you know you're gonna die, rip that thing off, <laughs> disappear from the world. Seems like a pretty easy exploit, pretty easy mechanic to. The problem is okay. there's there's no consistency. I, I have a whole script written up about that mo- movie too. It's it's it's, so, it's bad, man. Listen, you you got that the fucking main character has has a a device that talks to every player in the game. What kind of feature is that? If you put that in a game, it would get ab- abused it, so hard. It, it would be gone within a day because people would be saying the N word nonstop and they'd be saying <laughs> all these things. Like it would be done. Yeah. That wouldn't be in the game. And you're telling me you got a billion people playing this f-ing thing and nobody went backwards on accident into the. F- oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus, Louise. Five years. This movie. Like, ugh. And I had mentioned this in our review about it, but, uh, like we were talking about games done quick a little bit earlier and people will figure out how to rewrite the game code with a character on screen. They'll move, you know, you, that's what I'm saying. You go three to the left, do something, go four to the right, do something. And then now you're, you're playing pog in a, a completely different game, right? Like, it, or, and, I just cannot buy that if there is $500 billion on the line, people would not figure out these simple puzzles. Yeah. They were, I mean, especially when you have an entire community of, of possibly over a billion people. Gunters is the dumbest name I've ever heard. Also just need to say that. (laughs) Well, uh, it's the thing is, any game, when, when you get a big game, mm-hmm. when you have millions of people playing it, these people inadvertently or otherwise find ways to break the game yeah. or to push it to its limits and they find all the cracks of it. And it's just no way. This has got billions it, it, of people playing it too. Billions. Oh my God. And uh, I think the problem was that Spielberg doesn't understand video game. Culture, I don't think Spielberg games. did anything on this movie. Uh, you, you don't think he showed up and said, action? I think he put uh, his name on it. <laughs> I mean, it's all CGI. Easy. What was he supposed to do? Red Letter Media's review of it? I uh, know I didn't. Where they said he, he accepted to do the movie because he only had to do 11 minutes of live action. <laughs> yeah. That's all he had to show up for. <laughs> like, it's a cartoon. I don't know why yeah. we act like CGI movies... Or anything more than that. Like, it, it, that's what it was. It, it, it's fine, but it's not good. Like, it's a, it's a bunch of references. I can read a Wikipedia article on the eighties and well, I, get the same emotions. That's the thing too. I, I thought the references were wasted. Yeah. Like, if you're going to go through the effort to have Master Chief and Tracer, and Chucky and Jason, all these people, you have to do more than just put them on screen for a couple seconds. Yeah. Make them do the thing that they do. Like, have them contribute to the action scene in their own unique, characteristic way. Well, the, the one interesting, of, the one thing they probably got close to being accurate to video games is that skins don't really change anything, right? And so if everyone's just wearing yeah. a different skin... Then yeah, maybe they don't get to do anything special. But this is a movie. You you seem to like focus on one of the aspects that would be cool to see, but not the others. Like this, I, I can't. I Ready Player One just makes me mad. It's it's it, really bad. It upset me. I came in there with zero expectations, and I you know I just want to be swept away, like uh, that anime uh, movie. Princess Mononoke? Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. But I, I just... <laughs> and I I was into the movie for about 10 minutes, and then in the club is when it all fell apart. When they started dancing, it's kind of like, wait. Um, you know? It's yeah. It's starting to show its cracks. 
For me, but it was when they were battling their knowledge of Halliday. That's when I gave up. I was like, it's dumb. Oh, and like, so after the race? After the then... race, yeah. And she's like, well, what's his favorite movies? And he's like, oh, do you mean this? Or do you mean that? Or do you mean this? And it's just like, ooh, yeah. you guys are the worst kind of people. Nobody likes you. Well, and then they had the chest burster scene, which was really, uh, really out of place. Yeah. The whole, I, the I whole that was movie really was dumb. The Clark Kent glasses oh, yeah, yeah. and none of it was good. And Batman yeah, looks stupid. True. What was up with that? Why did Batman look so goofy when he's climbing the mountain? What was wrong with that Batman? It's Lego Batman. But he was stretched it's out. Lego. He was as tall as the other people. Listen, man. It was dumb. It's Spielberg, so everything you say is wrong. <laughs> what has Spielberg done that's been good for uh, recently? That's what I was saying, too. I have a whole script written up. I, I shouldn't be talking about this. I should save it. But Sp- Spielberg hasn't done anything exceptional in, like, 15 years. I think one of my – one of his more recent – the Band of Brothers was right. That's Catch Spielberg. Me If You Can. Catch Me If You Can is good. That's like one of his his last truly magical movie. I think Jaws was great because the shark was terrible. The he would have put way too much of the shark in that movie, and it would not yeah. it not been good. But because the shark didn't work, they're like, well, we're just gonna have to make what you don't see scary, and it's like. Oh, that's how you make a horror movie. Great idea, guys. The entire movie of Ready Player One was the shark in action. Yeah. In a, yeah. In a way. Yeah. No, exactly. Like, everything that he wanted to do... Well, again, I don't think that he even cared. <laughs> everything anyone... so either. <laughs> anyone wanted to put in there. They're like, yeah, if we have the rights for it, let's throw it in. And because it's WB, or Warner Brothers... They they have a lot of rights to things. And, yeah, like you know, thirty three percent of it. They threw in a ton and ton of stuff. Yeah, I I thought that movie was a little blasphemous. And uh, when they spawned a Gundam in, the kids in front of us stuck their arms up in the air and blocked the screen. <laughs> Out of like they triumph, so they were so excited. They couldn't believe that they saw a Gundam on screen. I didn't but know. I was thinking. I didn't know that was still Gundam? popular. Like I thought that was like a. There's a million a toy. other things you could have picked. Yeah, I thought Gundam that was. What I have seen Gundam since like the late '90s or early 2000s. Like, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I thought Gundam was just a big people moment. who collect toys. Don't don't like even a pow- it's a giant Power Ranger or a Transformer something like I I. Don't, Maybe maybe the rights to Gundam was just much cheaper than anything that actually matters. Well, that that I don't know that fight that should have been the Iron Giant. That should have been the Iron Giant's job. Yeah, like <laughs> he should have he should have never. You're right. What sh- a mess! <laughs> it oh should have God. never been the Iron Giant leading the charge. The Iron Giant should have shown up to fight him. They established that he was building it. They established all that stuff. When the, what was it, the Mecha, Mecha Godzilla shows up, the Iron Giant should yeah. have fought him. Yeah. Like, that's how you tell a story. You, you, like, I know they, they showed the glove and that you get a power up and all that type of stuff. Don't do that. Or use that in another way. The Iron Giant was meant to fight the Mega Godzilla. Mecha Godzilla. No, that's true. Like that, they just made Iron Giant kind of redundant, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. Wow. When they established him way long ago in a way that made sense. It made complete sense that he was building it and like working on it and like it meant something to him. You know what I mean? Like there was emotional attachment to that Iron Giant way like that was naturally established. But yet they're like, oh, Gundam time. And then the guy jumps off and just this. What it should have been. You're going to tell me. Should have been like. Go on. (laughs) I can't even think of anything. I was going to say like Mighty Mouse, the superhero mouse from the 80s. 
fighting Mecha Godzilla, like something that's not not reasonable but also effective. Yeah, but that's the thing too is there's a bit of an opportunity paralysis with there's an unlimited amount of things you can pull from to have it do something. Yeah. And yeah, I, it would be very difficult to really just pull the trigger on one and say, this is the one it has to be. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, for sure. That's why I should have been the Iron Giant. Yeah. No, you're right. Cause it was built up literally. Naturally. And, too. uh, didn't like it wasn't yeah. forced. It made sense. No. It's beloved character that someone that age probably would consider making. Yes. Player Let's one, back to ready Kingsman. player one is bad. Kingsman two is bad. They're both very bloated movies. Yeah. They're both very, I think, disrespectful to their audiences. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, both- what I would do if Kingsman two was my responsibility, Colin Firth never comes back. Merlin takes the place of, of the amnesia, Lancelot, never dies she's the romantic interest they have they're, yeah, they're not dating but they're he's attracted to her she's annoyed with him There's tension yeah uh channing tatum takes place of uh colin, colin firth. firth not not it's with amnesia but not with uh so not with not with the mental issues but just in the role of supporting him and whiskey can still be the guy who betrays everyone I don't think you should have a double agent because I think that is so overplayed. I'm surprised they went with the, yeah. oh, he's a double agent plot line because that's, I don't, there's so few spy movies that don't have a double agent twist in them. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, su- but he was, he's not a double agent. I'm sorry. I should say he, yeah. he, well, he betrays, he him. just wanted to contribute to killing everybody in the world because somebody on drugs killed his wife. Yeah. So he wants to kill half a billion people, or, or I mean, sorry, half the world's population, because of that. And give Jeff it, Bridges it, a different haircut. That's my last point. Get, you know, get him out of the movie. <laughs> what is he doing? Like, I think, like, he's trying to add depth into his character by being this uh, sort of alcoholic that puts the, oh, he always puts the liquor in his mouth and swishes it around and then spits it out. Like he he never drink it, mm. but I think he's this alcoholic that that you know owns a distillery. Well, is he flavor in his chewing tobacco? Oh, you know he maybe, maybe yeah. I actually don't know. I think people do that. I, mean, I could be wrong, but I believe you can soak your your chew with uh, alcohol. But here here's what I would have done. All right. I, mm. I sort of put th- through this into my video. Have no Colin Firth. Yes. Get, um, leave the lady alive, Lancelot. Mm-hmm. Um, whiskey should be, become Eggsy's new father figure. Whiskey? Yeah. Okay. But I think he should be like the, the inverse of Colin Firth saying, you don't need no manners. Manners don't make no man. All you got to do is be like this and this. And, like, have his life advice conflict with Colin Firth's. And Eggsy has to pick and choose between each of his mentors to become his own person. So when you say deal. whiskey, whiskey was the uh, guy with the lasso, right? P- yeah, Pedro Pascal. Yeah, okay. Because your, your like, voice I, was of Jeff Bridges. Well, I only got... A couple southern <laughs> accents I can pull off. Because I, I think he would be a bad choice of an actor if that's the character you want to go with. I think Jeff Bridges in that role of whiskey like that would make more sense of someone who's like, you don't need class. Like, just get things done. That would make more sense. But the other guy, the guy who, Pedro Pascal, he's too suave yeah. to be, uh. Too what? Slav? Suave? Oh. Like he's got too much charisma so? to be. What's that? I I thought I think he'd make a pretty good mentor figure for Eggsy. Yeah, no, I'm, I agree. I'm just saying that if you want to go with that route of him kind of like taking away 
uh, the gentleman aspect of it. It would be harder mm-hmm. with him because he's so suave, so debonair. I don't think, I don't think so. No? The, um, whiskey? I thought, I thought he was kind of like, um, kind of in between. He's not like a complete gentleman. He's hitting on everybody and he's very, he's somewhat naive and, uh, a bit, I guess, broken with the loss of his wife. Mm hmm. To where he, he's got that, that phone that vibrates and he also <laughs> has that, uh, the detachment from Eggsy, I think that Colin Firth might, I don't know. I, I, it works when, in my head. I don't want to get hung up on the details. Yeah. Anymore, but instead of having to save the world again, have the, the villains be a secret organization that are like they're full of Kingsman rejects yeah. that are looking to take the Kingsman down because they feel like they deserve to be in the place of the Kingsman. Like who are you to decide who becomes, who goes to the top and who doesn't like mm. we've we, we're so, so it's a organization full of very capable, very smart people, which also would be funded by their very rich people parents and <laughs> because they they were all you know born with a silver spoon up their ass as they say in the first movie and so they could have like kind of janky but also high-tech gadgetry that the kingsman wouldn't expect and it, it i think that would lead to really good conflict and it wouldn't be so formulaic yeah. like they're not trying to trying to take over the world they just want to take out the Kingsmen and the Statesmen have been fighting them for a little while and they organically bump into the Kingsmen that way. And, you know, Pedro and, and Eggsy become good friends. And, I, you know, him being the new mentor figure would put a conflict within Eggsy and, and make him doubt himself a little bit. Yeah. And he'd have to learn to be his own person and become strong by the end of it. Uh, and Julianne Moore could still be the villain. No, take her out. Well, if she, you know, she could. No. She doesn't have to do anything. <laughs> but Maybe she could be one of the somebody... moms. I, I'm so tired of the psychopathic, calm, collected woman villain. It's not fun. It's not, it's not subversive anymore. Okay, they've done it so many times where it's just like, okay, who cares? You're really not scary. You're right, but. She did it well, I thought. I thought she, she didn't have anything to work with, but she but did what her is, damnedest to make it work. What does that mean? She did something bad well. She, she had nothing. She had this character with nothing, but yeah. she made it feel, she brought more life to it than most other actresses would have, I think. Yeah, I, I'm not saying she's a bad actress. I think the character is awful. Yeah, oh, the, absolutely. The yeah. same with, uh, who was it in The Defender, Sigourney Weaver? Is that right? Yeah. She was terrible. Who's the worst? I didn't finish it. The Defenders is awful. Punisher is pretty I good. I saw six episodes of The Defenders, and I, yeah, Sigourney was snoozing like Bruce Willis in Death Wish <laughs> through that whole movie yeah. or the whole show. Yep. She didn't care. She didn't want to be there. She doesn't know what she's even talking about. Well, did you? Yeah. Do you, you do you care about spoilers for that? I assume you don't. No. Did you get to the point where she died? No. So Electra kills her. Good. And That's predictable. There's zero reason for her to really have ever been there, because Electra just continues what she was doing. So she Electra doesn't turn to being good. At the end, she does. Sort of. Does she remember herself and all that? Uh, yeah, a bit. It's like they slowly build back her memories, but they still end up fighting and, uh, the, the cave of dragon bones collapses on top of her and Matt Murdock. Dragon bones? Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, alright. Well, she had amnesia like Colin Firth. 
Amnesia is a terrible story device, too. It always has been. That's why they use it in soap operas all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it, it's lazy. It's very lazy. It's too convenient to add conflict. And I've never met anyone who has amnesia. Me neither. I've seen a lot of movies I've, about I've it. I've never even, not even by proxy. Yeah. I don't know a guy who knows a guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's only a handful of people who get it a year, I'd, I'd wager. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's really, it's a really lazy device to add conflict. But, but I but think. here's the thing. Go ahead. Go on. I was just going to say, <laughs> I was just going to say the idea about making Colin Firth the ultimate bad guy is probably the best movie that I could imagine the second Kingsman being, but it would have to have been set up and established from the first one to where Colin yeah. Firth is helping Eggsy and then becomes the ultimate villain for him in the second one. And he, I think you would have to... He's worthy adversary, too. Like yeah. He'd be really tough to take down. Yeah. Because, like, the way they, they establish his character, or uh, Eggsy's remorse about losing Colin Firth, is, like, so powerful to him. Like, he's, like, about to cry just talking about silverware in the beginning. Right? Like, when she's... Yeah. Like, do you know? <laughs> yeah. And he's like... I got this on lock. And then he has this flashback similar to Rocky four talking to, uh, Mickey at the, <laughs> the boxing ring. He has this flashback of Colin Firth teaching him how to use the utensils. And it's like very yeah, powerful. HLKP, right? What's that? Or HKLP holds knife like pen. Yeah. Holds knife like pen. And See, I wish I didn't know that. I wish I didn't know the fucking lines of the movie, <laughs> but I, <laughs> but yeah, so, I, Making Colin Firth the bad I, guy uh, would have really been a powerful moment for the movie, for Eggsy, and I, I think for the audience. I think it would have meant something. Because if if you didn't see Colin Firth get shot, right, in the first one, because they, they show the cutaway of him falling, if you only see it from his point of view, where the glasses get shot, and then he comes back and they reveal that, no, he was a part of it. He intended to have that happen. Then it's like, oh, wow, this is... There's a lot more. To make the Kingsman think he's dead. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would have been interesting, but, you know. I think that's fun, a fun idea to play with. That's it. I'm making my fan fiction Kingsman 2. <clears throat> yeah. No. Well, it's better than what, what we got. <laughs> but here's the deal too. All right. I've heard, I don't know how I missed this either, but I've heard that there are pictures of them on the set at the wedding at the end of the golden circle mm. when Eggsy is getting married to a princess. We got a spy g- getting married, to, uh, whatever. Yeah. That, um, the bald boy who blew up Merlin? was there. He was there at the wedding with wearing uh, green leggings. Okay. For green screen. Cause uh-huh. he was going to have robot legs. Oh, uh. but they cut that out. That's a so, good idea. <laughs> No, he actually, in in the eyes of the of Matthew Vaughn, yeah. at some point he actually lived. He he survives the the landmine explosion, yeah. which I don't know. If that makes it better or though, worse. I don't know. That makes it. W- w- <laughs> That's what <laughs> I'm saying. Is it, like, is that better or worse? Is it him just dying like that unceremoniously? Is that better than him surviving and coming back with robot legs? That fits more in line with this movie, especially when you consider them bringing people back to life from a headshot wound. Like, yeah, him coming back with robot legs, I'm kind of on board with for the second movie, the tone of it. Do you know what I mean? Not, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't want to see that happen. Yeah, no, I understand, but and like, I, I agree with you. I, I'm like, yeah, but that that would fit better. The fact it, that it would that, play better that. that Eggsy steps on a landmine is like watching, imagine you're watching a superhero movie. Cause these people are essentially superheroes within yeah. its universe. Mm-hmm. And, and Captain America has a minesweeper in his hand and he's sweeping the floor and he steps on the only mine that is, first of all, not only sticking up out of the ground that you can visibly see just by looking at the floor. Mm-hmm. Captain America steps on this landmine, right? Or a superhero. 
a, t- a tactical genius, whatever. Yeah. I don't know much about him because I don't care because he's a <laughs> superhero. Come at me. <laughs> but you got a superhero stepping on a landmine. Uh, how, like, that's, I, 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 I can't even, I, I struggle to talk about it. I get flustered because I shouldn't need to say anything. I, that, I shouldn't have to s- explain why that's dumb in every conceivable way. But not only that, but they had the freeze spray and he freezes the landmine and, uh, some commenters pointed out they could have just put a rock. On the landmine. Yep. During that time. Like, or just take off your shoe and put sand in it. Like, seriously. Or get through all the landmines, get in a gunfight, and then accidentally step on it. During the gunfight. During fight. the fight? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I like that idea. In- incorporate you- the landmines into the action scene. Yeah. Because so- there's only like 10 guys at, at her, her palace. Yeah. Because so, yeah, that, that would fight make out- you back up, right? Like, if someone starts shooting at you... you- you wouldn't be as concerned about landmines at that moment. No, that'd be really cool. Cause like Eggsy accidentally steps on it in the middle of a fight. And now he knows he's on it and he can't move. So he's like fighting with his foot on it. That should have know? been the single take that would have been cool. action uh, scene. Him I think, yeah. stuck on a landmine. Uh, <laughs> we we need right to about that. rewrite and reshoot all of this. Let's get on it. Absolutely. <laughs> But I came at the video. I gotta, I gotta, I might have made a mistake. I'm not sure. But I came at the video from the perspective that the studio made, forced Matthew Vaughn to make decisions with the movie that ultimately ended up ruining it. Yeah. And I say that because Matthew Vaughn has a really great track record. He, mm-hmm. He's made really, at worst, decent movies. He's, I think he's a very talented director. And you, yet you have him having the characters step on a landmine. That just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I th- really thought it was studio interference, but I'm told by a lot of comments that there was zero interference at all, that Matthew Vaughn just messed up, that he made this bloated, initially four-hour-long movie that got out of hand yeah. he went a little f- too far in a few places and if i i don't want to look it up because if i'm wrong i don't want to know because <laughs> the video is already out but I- if i am wrong it doesn't change anything i'd say about the movie just switch the studio made this stupid decision to matthew vaughn's an idiot for doing this yeah like it doesn't change anything the movie is still blasphemous I think it's slightly well, worse. I think, I think it's that a fair. Matthew Vaughn wouldn't understand. I think it's a fair place to put the blame on, on the studio because it was rushed. It's clearly rushed. The movie came out. What was the What was the length of time? Three years. Three years. Three okay. years. Maybe yeah. it's not that rushed. It really but, wasn't. Uh, <clears throat> it feels like it was. Yeah, it definitely feels like it was. The but even just making the second one, it did not feel like anyone wanted to. It didn't feel like anyone uh, was having Edgerton fun. Definitely wanted to, but the the, Taren, the guy who plays Eggsy, yeah, yeah. these Kingsman movies are mm-hmm. his life. They are so important to him. Um, I I spent an entire day, eight hours, watching interviews with all the celebrities in the movies, yeah. all the, the behind the scenes garbage. And this this franchise is his life. He, it is so important to him. Yeah, I um, mean, I can't really blame the guy. <laughs> no, absolutely not. It made him, and it's he sees in real life Colin Firth as a father figure, mm. and it it really helps with their chemistry. And yeah, I think. <sighs> and a sequel really could have been great too. Yeah, yeah, they, they had. But it's like you said, bringing in America is too much too soon. Oh, for the yeah. third movie, yeah. fourth. Uh, it's it's honestly the last thing you do. It's the the end of the series when you bring in, yeah. like when you add in 
oh, this is more than just us. You know, like this is, I mean, cause the whole, it was the doomsday plan was the bottle of whiskey, right? Our last thing yeah. that we can do is go find these people essentially is what they're saying. That, that is yeah. accurate to making this movie too. <laughs> you know, this is your last ditch effort to make something compelling. And they, they wasted so many other story arcs and story beats and things they could have done in this universe because they jumped ahead so far. But th- that's the thing too that makes me think it's studio interference. Matthew Vaughn absolutely loves these characters. He's so passionate about them, but he, yet he kills off 90% of them and brings one back only to have him be uh, reduced, a reduced version of himself. And like, it just, I, I don't, it just doesn't make sense to me that he would willingly or knowingly do that. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, it, it, it takes away any, any, uh, substance of someone dying. If someone dies in the movie. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. But I, I, I just, what I'm saying is I'd like to think Matthew Vaughn has the wherewithal to know that, like what he's doing with, with these movies, him mm. and Jane Goldman is his co-writer. Jane Goldsman, one of the two. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I really, I don't see how it could be his fault entirely. Um, but yeah, knows? it, I mean, it's kind of everyone, everyone who worked on this, like, I mean, part of the, the first one worked because essentially it's a superhero movie and it's a superhero origin story. And those are much easier to do, I think, than the follow up. So they had, they came in with no one had any expectations of the first one being good and it was solid. So it being solid with no expectations makes it outstanding, which is kind of unfair. So they were trying to meet the expectations of the second one and they didn't know what the best way to go about that was. So they went, went with, let's just do what worked the first time. And they just tried to copy. They didn't, I mean, they copied it pretty much beat for beat, but they tried to copy the heart of what they did. And you can't do that. You can't just copy yeah. the, the, the heart of it because it's not how it works. You can't, it's not one plus one equals two when it comes to eliciting emotions from someone. It's, you have to earn it. You have to, make it all fit together and make sense. And when the time comes, then it works. But if you don't do that, it's it, like the barroom scene when Colin Firth fights the guys in the first one, you are yeah. so intrigued and invested into it because, okay, there's one guy with an umbrella. There's no way this is going to end well for him. Why is he so confident in the second one? It's like, okay, well, this is just the same thing again. And oh, haha, ha, yeah. it didn't work for him, but now whiskey's gonna come in and do the same thing that should have happened already. Like it's, there's no, there's no in, engagement from the audience in that. It's just like, uh, you're, you're just making a parody of yourself? Like, why? Well, that's the thing too, that, 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 that I don't under, I don't understand is the first movie was anything but safe. Yeah. But with the sequel, they just played it so safe. And that, in a way, spits in the face of itself, of its own franchise. Yeah. So, I, I don't see how it could be Matthew Vaughn's fault. I, I, I really. I figured out what the third one is going to be. But I could be wrong. You figured it out? Yeah. The third one is going to be The King's Woman. Oh no. I know you were saying the Chinaman, but it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a feminist uh Yeah, but none of them are white. Line. It's all all the women are there's one white, there's one of each. One of each, just a rainbow just, coalition of uh yeah. of women. The king's women. Yeah. And they have to fight men. For- <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, speaking of that, 
Last point I think I'm going to make. Uh, Ocean's 8 looks terrible. Yeah. What, well, why, why are they doing this thing where it's like, we're going to have, we're going to remake a movie, but all women. Yeah, it doesn't. Like that. That's not equality. That's just pandering. Yeah. Also, the, what's more offensive is they, they're starting with number eight. Which means they have room for number nine and number ten before they hit to eleven again. They're setting it up for oh, a trilogy. I think you're right. Yeah, that's why they went back to eight with Sandra Bullock's. <laughs> but anything else about the Kingsman? I think I've said everything I have. To no, say. I, I think I I clarified everything I needed to, and. Uh, You've, you've reopened the wound. You've reopened it for me. <laughs> You're welcome. Because well, when I did that video, King, Kingsman was my life, like Taron Edgerton, for a good month. To where it was, I was dreaming about it. I was, all I could think about was that. Like I went to a, a steak restaurant and there was boots and cowboy hats up. And I was like, that's just like the statesman would eat here. <laughs> like it was bad. <laughs> then my life was consumed by it. And I, it took me a, a while after I did the video to get over it and like move on and, and to normal life. As, as lame as that sounds, that's, I was in, I was in deep and, uh, um, it was, it's good to be back. <laughs> well, how can people find your, your YouTube channel? Uh, just, you know, certain key phrases, tags with their keyboard and they'll, and my channel will come right up. Simple as that. All right. Well, no, you got to go to nope. Ren's Reviews. That's I, Ren with two N's. I'm going to bleep all of this Your favorite little boy out. in the whole wide world. You had your opportunity <laughs> and you wasted it. And uh, uh, um, Ren's Reviews, you check out my Kingsman video. It, uh, it, it nearly broke me several times. And also, uh, I, ha- I have other videos about movies and TV shows as well. And video game stuff. It's a fun time. It's a good romp. And, uh, I make sure that there's something for everybody to enjoy in my videos. And, um, hopefully you didn't bleep that out. I bleeped it all out. It's just white noise, okay. just static. Not only okay. did people not hear it, but they they just shut it off because they were so frustrated by how annoying the sounds I put it over was. Yeah, they tr- shut it off and they're like... Let's watch the new episode of Roseanne. <laughs> um, but yeah, so me and Taylor will be back. Our next episode will be on the wall with John Cena and, uh, Aaron Tyler, Aaron Taylor Paul or something like that. I don't remember his name, but uh, that was an interesting one. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Paul Johnson, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Yes. From Breaking Bad? No. From Kickass. Who's that? Oh. What is this movie? Okay. The Wall. It's a Hulu original. Snipers get pinned down by another sniper in a, uh, Iraq. Oh, you've said enough. Iraq. Hulu original. I'm tuned out. Uh, it's not good. Spoiler. Yeah. I, yeah. But yeah, so we'll be back with that okay. in a couple of days. You can follow us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. I seen that pod. Like us on Facebook and uh, check out Ren's channel over on YouTube. Give him some thumbs downs and some nasty comments. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Bye.